Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open Romans chapter 8. Uh, we will be jumping around the Bible tonight, but we will look at Romans chapter 8 uh, very quickly. The, the message tonight is titled, The Prayers of a Righteous Man. And I got that from the, of James chapter 5, verse, the end of verse 16, where it says, A prayers of a righteous man can accomplish much. And James equates the, not just the child of God, when he prays, can accomplish much, but he says the righteous man, the one who's right with the Lord, the one who's desperate for the Lord, the one who's to place his dependency on the Lord, a righteous man, one who wants to walk by faith in the Lord, those are the prayers offered by that person that James in the Word of God says can accomplish much. And that is the end of James 5, verse 16, the end of verse 16 of James chapter 5. And tonight I want to talk to you again and put out a challenge tonight. I'm going to put out a challenge. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what it is. I'm going to put out a challenge for you tonight that is clearly taught in the Word of God. It's a practice that's been clearly practiced all throughout the Bible and all throughout church history. I put out a challenge to you as members of a body of First Baptist Putney in this season of the life of First Baptist Putney. We're members, I think we're all members in this room, to fast. And I'm going to put out a challenge not just to do that, and I'm going to give you some things that I'm going to ask you to fast about. Now you can add to your own list, and you should, about your family member or about this situation going on in your life or loved one. But on top of your list, I want to ask you to fast, which is clearly taught in the Word of God, which is one of the ways how we express humility and dependency upon the Lord. And how we sincerely and diligently are seeking the Lord. By giving up something and giving up time to spend extra time in seeking out the heart of Almighty God about a certain matter. I'm going to ask you to pray about the lostness of our community. I'm going to ask you to pray the same prayer that was placed a burden on the heart of Jonathan Edwards. What was that prayer? Oh God, give me New England. Oh God, give me New England. And God used Jonathan Edwards to begin a spark that began a revival throughout New England and America. And I'm going to ask you to pray and fast on a consistent basis about, go God, give us the community of Putney. Oh God, give us Putney. And our motivation behind that prayer is to honor God. But we understand that we can't do nothing good with Putney. We understand that we don't have the resources or the wisdom what to do, but we, we're desperate putting ourselves before God to give us something that we can't do ourselves. And we're agreeing with God. We know that the Bible teaches that the folks of Putney are special and important to the heart of God, and we're saying, God, entrust us with them. But for God, for us to have them, you're going to have to give them to us because we can't do it. Amen? Amen. Ronnie Floyd shares this story about when, I don't remember exactly how long ago it was, but he was asked to speak um, to members of Campus Crusade for Christ. And he said there were thousands of people there. Most of them were in the ministry or they were evangelists or they were missionaries. And he called them and challenged them to fast. Fast where God has them. The nation, maybe some were in America living, some were living in another country. The fast for the nation that God has you right now. Then He asks you to fast for where God has you, the ministry God has you, the, the people that God has you that influence Him. Then He said, ask them, I ask them to fast for, lost, for the lost people, for the lost souls. By the way, you've heard me say this, but it just is fascinating to me. It gives me a, a kind of a rebuke and a shot in the arm at the same time. You know, 
many people would say that the sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached, Sinners in the Hand of Angry God, which he read word for word, holding it like his notes up to here, they would say that was the greatest, most powerful sermon outside the Bible ever been preached. But do you know that they say that a few days before he preached that message, he didn't eat a bite of food, he didn't sleep in one minute, but he was so burdened praying for the souls of his people. And by the way, testimony says those who were listening to that message that he read to them, they thought that hell was at the door. And that that was maybe their last chance to make a decision. What am I going to do with Jesus? Because hell is knocking at the door. See, folks, what are they saying? I'm going to give a little testimony. They're saying, I'm going to give a testimony when the power of God showed up. When a man of God, when a child of God went from placing dependency upon his resource, his skills, and place say, God, I'm concerned and burdened for your people. And, he, and by the way, it's, he, Jonathan Edward had poor eyesight. He was, a, he was not a good speaker. But do you know what? None of that limited what God did that day. And when you and I say, well, I don't do this, and I got this problem, and all this, and you don't know about this, it won't limit what God can do in your life if you're surrendered to God. Because as we continue to talk about, because the Bible continues to talk about, God is a big God. And He's more aware of your flaws and limitations than you are. And you know what? Your flaws and limitations does not make him nervous. He desires for you to place your dependency totally, completely upon him. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You know what he's saying? If God is for us, if we're right with God, it don't matter. If me and God are right and I'm in tune with the heart of God, it don't matter how many folks are gathering up outside to come get me. It don't matter how big or large my flaws are. It don't matter how small my skill set is. Nothing matters if I am right with God. Amen? What does Jeremiah say? Jeremiah chapter 29, starting in verse 11. Jeremiah says, or the Lord says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declared the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when what? All, you see, when you're dependent upon me, when you're desperate for me, when you're serious. Not, that's why James can say the prayers of a righteous man accomplish much. When you're willing to be righteous, and I, you like King Jehoshaphat, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. When you have dealt with your pride and humbled yourself, and you seek God with all your heart, what are some application of me expressing myself, dependency, and seeking God with all my heart when I fast? When I give up something that I enjoy or I need to put it before, to spend more time with God about a matter. Amen? How about what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35. And Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel. By the way, we, everywhere Christ went, He proclaimed the gospel. Everywhere we go, we've been empowered. If you're a child of God, you've been commanded and empowered by God to proclaim the gospel. He says, proclaim the gospel in the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And seeing the multitudes, he felt compassion for them. 
because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. By the way, felt compassion mean it was gut-wrenching, meaning I have to do something. I can't walk by this. You've seen some things that bothered you, but you kept on going, didn't you? This is not what they're talking about. It was so gut-wrenching that Jesus says, I have to do so. I can't walk by this. In verse 37, And Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. What is Jesus saying there? He, did he say that, you know, I was traveling from town to town proclaiming the gospel. I saw the great needs of the people. They were like sheep without a shepherd. So I turned to my disciples and I said, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. So get busy. He, or did he say, your program you're, try, you're trying to get it, reach them with, ain't working, get a different program. Is that what he said? He said, no, you, we, you live in desperate times for the souls of men. And the only way you're going to reach men is get to the heart of God. And how do I, the workers are few. By the way, you're not a worker in evangelism for the gospel if you had partner that proclaiming the gospel with getting on your knees and crying out to God for their souls. Amen? You have to partner by gospel, sharing the gospel with on your knees crying out for the souls. On your knees making sure that you and God are right because remember the prayers of a righteous man accomplish much. By the way, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, wrote a book called uh, Win Winning the Lost Souls. And do you know he spent 75% of that book talking about your relationship with God? Because the prayers of a righteous man accomplish much. A righteous man is understand how desperate they are for God, how much they need to get the ear of God. The righteous man gets inspired, gets a shot in the arm to go out and proclaim the gospel. You know, many of us don't proclaim the gospel, and many times when we do proclaim the gospel, we're in the flesh. Because we're scared to death. Or we're this or that. That's not, the, that's not being a righteous man. A person who's got along with God and let God deal with them, they'll go out with whatever personality they have, with whatever background they grew up with, they'll go out and trust God and proclaim the gospel. Not in their strength, but in His strength. Well, how do you know they'll have the history? Because they've gotten along with Him. They have clearly communicated to themselves to the Lord that their dependency is completely upon Him. Amen? And Jesus is saying here, guys, we live in desperate... You don't recognize how desperate of the time we live in for the souls of men. You don't realize, because you're not moved with compassion, you don't realize how lost people are all around you. And because we don't have that realization. I mean, we know what the Bible says, but we don't have that realization how desperate of a time we live in. I mean, usually when we say we live in desperate times, it's because the government did something you, you don't understand or don't like. You know, oh, Jesus come back any time now. But you, we don't get, feel that way when we know old Tom over here might die and go to hell. Or that family over there, who I don't even know their name, they might die and go to hell. Jesus is saying, guys, this is desperate times. And you can't win them in your own strength. You've got to get right with God and place your dependency upon the Lord. Pray for their souls and pray for your witness and pray that you're right with God and then you go out and tell them and the power of God. Jesus was moved with compassion. Notice he didn't say Jesus and the disciples were moved with compassion. We live with desperate times and we need to express an attitude to the Lord that we're desperate for Him to do a work in my life. For him to do a work in my home. For Him to do a work in His church. And Him to do a work in this world. And now I want to place my dependency and I want to, uh, want Him and I want to partner with Him. 
But this is how we, I partner with him. I partner with him by what he says I need to do. I don't go to God and say, I'm going to do this and that's it. I don't go to God and say, here's my terms. That's not partnering with God. I go to God on my face. That's the beginning of partnering with God. Is that where you are tonight? Let me say this. If that is not where you are tonight, then you are not in the right place. And you're standing with the Lord. If you're not moved with compassion for the lost and recognize as Christ testifies, we're in desperate time, then you, there's a disconnect between you and the Lord Jesus somewhere. And that disconnect is caused by sin. I need to be moved what moves Christ. Amen? Amen? And I need to get that right before Almighty God. Let's look at point one, Roman numeral run. God's power comes from humility. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in proper time. You know, it's interesting there, because usually we think we're exalted, or we think I'll exalt myself, I'll build myself up, and we spend a lot of time doing that. But notice there where Peter says, you'll never be exalted, you're not exalted, unless God does it, and God won't do it unless you first humble yourself. You know, as Manly Beasley says, revival begins when the bottom falls out. When you deal with your pride. By the way, I think I said this last week. The world, and we believe this inside and out because we've been taught this from every way possible since we've been alive. The world admires strength. They think strength is impressive. And little boys come in this world trying to be strong and impressive. And we try to do this. We try to be the sharpest this. Because we want to stand out. We want to win the favor. I, we want to be a little bit better. And that impresses the world. But you know, strength does not impress God. Because He's the source of strength. Weakness impresses God. Humility gets the attention of God. You know, someone said, I don't remember now, that God cannot help but to move when we are weak. When we humble ourselves and place dependency upon Him, we're not bowing up our back. God moves. Amen? I'll give you an example of this. One of my favorite examples is this in the Bible. It's found in the book of Jonah by, from a pagan king. Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Now this is where God has already told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, nope, won't go. And he ran the other way, didn't he? It didn't, does anything hinder the plans of God? Where did Jonah end up? I mean, he took the scenic route, but he ended up where God wanted him, didn't he? Now, and now Jonah goes through Nineveh proclaiming repentance. And, 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 and they'll listen, pray to repentance and... Um, the kingdom of God, and listen to what is the outcome of this. Starting in Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne. How about that? Laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes. This is the king. And he issued a proclamation and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let, do not let man, beast, or flock taste the thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered in sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly. How about this? King's turned into a preacher. Let him call on God earnestly. That each may turn from his wicked ways 
and from the violence which is in his hand. Who knows, the king says, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we shall not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had de declared. He would bring upon them and he did not do it. How about that? A king, a pagan king, when he said he heard this, he got out of his, rose up out of his throne. Took off his robe and sat in ashes. Well, that don't sound very prideful, does it? No, he recognized there's someone with a whole lot more authority in act here, in working here, than he has. And he didn't want to be a fool and buck with his authority. He wanted it, he wanted that, that one God Almighty, he wanted his mercy. And so he said, listen, not only am I going to fast, not only am I going to cry out and turn from my weak way, the Nineveh's going to do it. And he said, who knows, maybe God will show mercy to us. But we're at the hands of God, someone like greater than me. Isn't it interesting what a pagan king recognized immediately acts upon? And at the same time, the other side of that coin, isn't it interesting when God Almighty in heaven is still waiting for the answer, if my people called by my name will humble themselves. And here we have a pagan king said, not only am I going to do it, not only am I going to get off my throne, I'm going to call my whole nation to do it. He recognized something we take for granted. God's in control. God's in charge. And I don't need to buck what God says. And one of the ways that we don't buck what God says is we fast. Out of a sincere heart, not just going through the ritual. We say, God, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. By the way, that is always a good place to be. I can't do it. I don't know what to do. You're my only hope. You're all I got. And then God begins to move. God begins to move. By the way, the, right there, the, what did the Bible testify? The king calls for a fast, seeking the mercy of God. Did he receive the mercy of God? And does 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, does God not say, if my people called by my name will humble themselves? I've got some promises in store for you. Fasting is an expression of humility. Secondly, God's power comes to those who are desperate for the Lord. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans that I have for you, declare the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And what we read in Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus was felt compassion, they were like sheep without a shepherd, and the counsel he gave to his disciples, he's saying, guys, we are in desperate times for the souls of men. Are you desperate? Do you communicate to God that you're desperate for him to work in your life and through you and in this community? By the way, I want to read something to you from Vance Happner. And Vance Happner writ, that wrote this well, it was published in 1965. And Vance Happner kind of gives you his little explanation very quickly. While we don't have revival, what's keeping God's people from really seeking me? Because what does God say in verse 20, uh, Jeremiah 29, 13? And you shall seek me and find me, will you search for me all your heart? We, he, he, uh, 
Vance would say, well, we believe that we, if we seek God, we'd find Him. The problem with us, we can't decide if we want to search for Him with all our heart. And so Vance says this, Why do we pin our hopes on human plans and programs for the world's peace? Why do we pin our hopes on hopeless international organization with their godless laws? Now listen to this. Why are our churches, now this is 1965, why are our churches not crowded with prayer meetings? Even meetings, prayer meetings that last all night long while the church still has time to pray. So he's speaking of dependency and desperation and an earnesty that we need to realize why we still have time to pray because there will come a time we won't have time to pray. But where's the church? And praying to God. While God, by the grace of God, we still have that opportunity to call out. Now he gives his reason why. Why are the saints so anxious to get their sleep? Why sinners revel all night? And most of the professing church stays up after all, feasting its eyes on Sodom and Gomorrah brought into their living room. What is Vance saying? Vance is saying... Well, where is the prayer meetings that last? Where, what's happened to those? Why aren't they understanding and believing the Bible that we live in desperate time and time is short and we need to be praying, earnestly fasting for our concerns and the, for the lost souls of the community? Where's the church? And I didn't read this part. He also says, why aren't lost people being attracted to us? He said, well, the main reason... It's because the church are too enticed with the Sodom and Gomorrah of this world. And therefore, remember, go back to Jeremiah 29. We believe God's telling the truth. He said in verse 13, And you will seek me and find me. We believe that. Here's our disconnect. Here's our problem. It lines up what, what Vance Hatner would say. When you search for me with all our heart. We had not made a choice if we're all in or not. If we're desperate or not. We believe that we'll find God if we choose to be dead. I don't think any of us struggle with that. That God is faithful and He's going to honor His Word and we can trust His Word. Our struggle is, do I want it? Do I want it to, to pay the price to seek Him with all my heart? Do I want to adjust, as Henry Blackham would say, do I really want to adjust my life to what God's Word tells me to do? And that is a wrestling match you and I will have for the rest of our life. But if God wins that wrestling match in your heart, you'll get to experience abundant life. And if you win that wrestling match with the Lord, the Bible teaches we're fools. And it, because our, the result, what's our prize for us winning? Bondage. Le less influence and impact on our families and community and the people God has around us for the kingdom of God. A less enthusiasm and desire for hearing the word of God and being a part of what the Bible teaches. Proverbs 29, 18 where there's no vision, what happens to the people? Perish. What is one of the ways we express perishing? Make unbiblical decisions. You know, we were asked in our group Wednesday night, we were talking about kids playing sports and everything, and someone said, was that wrong? Nope, not unless it takes God's place. Nothing wrong with that at all, unless you put it where God should be in your life. Is there anything wrong with the things, having things in this world? Nope, but the problem is they become the enticement of our heart. Then it becomes a problem. And when I'm enticed by this over here, this bell and whistle over here, I can't be enticed at two places at the same time. Only God is, all, is uh, 
can do that. Only God can be all places all the time. I can't. That's why Paul said this one thing I do. Are you dependent upon the Lord? By the way, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul says this. Not that I have already attained it or have already become perfect, but part B says this. Paul says, I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold up by Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, as you heard me say many times, with the zeal and the passion that Christ pursued me, I pursue him. But see, this, this one thing I do, I can't pursue him with all the zeal if it's one of three things I do, or one of ten things I do. It has to be the one thing I do. And that's to pursue Jesus. And and we don't pursue Him without placing our dependency upon Him. By the way, speaking of placing our dependency upon God and being weak and God loves our humility and God moves when we are humble before Him. Again, and a lot of times it takes us to be against all human eyes before we'll get there. But King Jehoshaphat says this, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. O our God, will thou not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming up against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. King, King Jehoshaphat was against all human odds. Humanly speaking, he's cooked. He's done. But he runs to God. And guess what happened? He's not cooked. He's not done. God moves. God does a work. But you notice when God started to move? When, he, when King Jehoshaphat took his dependency and put it before the Lord. Just because, humanly speaking, it doesn't look like anything good can come out of that, that's the time to really get serious and desperate for God. There, you shouldn't be shook up because, humanly speaking, it don't look good. That's when you should say, I'm going to go to the one who sees beyond circumstance. And I'm going to make sure my dependency is completely upon him. And when someone says, I don't know how, how, how we can reach these people, well, you're right. We're in a good place. We're like King Jonathan. I don't know how to do it, but our eyes are on you, Lord. Because God can do it. What we've seen over the last few months and this last year, only God can do that. But God is calling us to search Him and seek Him. He says, and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. That's what He's calling for my life today. How do I express that all of my heart? Dependency, desperate to spend time with God in fasting. Now what is fasting? Fasting. Fasting is, I choose, it's a choice. I choose to give up a want. To give up a pleasure. To spend extra time with the Lord. For an example, you might say, well I spend my, most of my prayer time and Bible study time in the morning. And then I pray with the God a little as, all throughout the day. Well fasting is, you have that prayer time still in the morning with the Lord. You pray continue a little bit throughout the day as you normally do, but you take an extra block of time that day that you hadn't been in the habit of spending with the Lord. And you take that time and you said, instead of doing this, what I've been doing in this block of time, I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to spend that time with crying out to God. Fasting is not replacing the time you spend with the Lord. It's placing more dependency upon the Lord. Spend more time with God over matter. To be weak, say, God, it's against all human odds for this to happen. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you fasted over something? Did Jesus not say in Mark 9, 29, for some things only comes by more effort? Some things come by uh, the majority of the vote of the church? Is that what it says? I, what, what, what brings some things out, Jesus says? 
prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. And you know what we do at church? We have to have a vote to, to, to determine the will of God. And by the way, that vote, however it goes, whatever the subject, does not guarantee that was the will of God. It's hopefully it's an indicator that you heard from God, but that's no guarantee that, that however that vote went, that was God's will. Unless with that vote went, should we believe the Bible and do what the Bible says? Wouldn't it be better to fast over those decisions and hear from the Lord? Amen? Some things only come from prayer and from fasting. Very quickly, our time has gotten away from us, but I do want to hit a few points still. One of the fruits of the Spirit, very important to you and I, my Christian life, is self-discipline, self-control. Found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, self-control, being self-disciplined. And what does the Bible teach us there? Those who search for me with all the heart will find me. I have to discipline myself to get along extra with God. If you study the life of Jesus, look at the self-discipline, how he continued. It wasn't every blue moon. It's not, it wasn't just when he was scared or when he was shook it up or some big event around. It was all the time he continued to withdraw from people to be alone with the Father. And you also, while you're looking through the life of God, Jesus, while he withdrew, notice when did he do it? Was it just the morning time? No. Was it just the evening time? No. He was in a constant habit, not just daily, but many times a day, he would pull away and he would get along with the Father. And if Jesus Christ understood that he needed that communion along with God, then why didn't God's people understand and practice, I need to seek him with all my heart? Amen? If my people, called by my name, will humble themselves, by the way, you remember in John chapter 4, the story of the woman of the well? It, why were they there, by the way? I know y'all were going to be spiritual. So because they, God had a sovereign, fed in God's sovereign plan for them to go through Samaria because Jesus had an appointment to talk to the woman of the well. Very, that's very true. But why did the disciples think they were there? They were hungry. Where did, where, where, where did Jesus send the disciples? Go get some food. They're hungry. Physical need. And then Jesus has this encounter with the woman of the well, and he witnessed to her, and then she, and she leaves. And listen to what Jesus... Now the disciples have come back, and listen to what Jesus says to the disciples in John chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. In the meanwhile, the disciples were requesting Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. Verse 32, but Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And then the disciples, like us, were saying, did somebody already buy him a Big Mac? Somebody came by and gave him some fries, didn't they? That's not the food Jesus is talking about there, is it? He's talking about communion with the Father, isn't he? What is fasting? It's giving up the Big Mac. So you can have that other food. The food that Jesus is talking about here. I have food you don't know about. But see, I've got to give up me, my pleasure, to get tap into that food. And we won't always make that choice, will we? Because our pleasure, the desire of our pleasure, is pretty strong. But Jesus says again, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. The power of God through communion with God. Do you want that other food that Christ testifies about? It's going to cause, it calls for self-sacrifice. It calls for self-discipline. It calls for us to clearly communicate our dependency is shifting from us to Him. From us to Him. You know, I have a list there. Our time's getting away from us. Of nine things in your outline to fast about. I want to concentrate on verse, on number eight, number nine. 
Actually, I'm going to tie them together. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it said, the Bible says, But you shall receive power, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Jesus Christ is saying you, each individual in the body of Christ, each individual church in every season of that church's life is called to be a witness of the power of God across the street and around the world and everywhere in between. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible don't only just say that. He's saying that my helper, the Holy Spirit, will come and He'll give you the power to guide you, to strengthen you, how to be that witness as we tie it in with Jeremiah, when you seek me with all your heart. But they're witness. Are we willing to be a witness of God and the power of God? Where God has us, then we need to deal with our sin, don't we? Because when I'm in sin, it limits the power of the witness of God through my life. Listen, I, I'll find out for sure Monday, Wednesday, we have to get Noah back to his autism doctor and make it, and I've got a cousin stationed in Winter Robins, who only because of God had begin a, begin a relationship back with any family member. And why he chose me to be the first, God only knows. And we've never talked on the phone, we hadn't seen each other in 19 years. But in the last few months, we have sent a few messages back and forth to each other. And he's going to let me know tomorrow if we can meet lunch Wednesday. I, he's lost. And I'm called to be a witness to him. Well, if I've got sin in my life, it doesn't matter what the sin is. If I've got sin in my life, I am limiting the witness of the power of God to my cousin who I had seen in 19 years what God's done in my life and what He can do in His life. Amen? I mean, that's why Spurgeon's book on soul winning, he spent 75% of it, get right with God. Because you'll never be the witness you need to be until you become a righteous man. It's not about outlines or is EE -E better than faith or whatever. It's about the power of God working through you. Why does James say the righteous man accomplish much? Because it's the power of God working through him. So if I'm willing to be a witness and place my dependency upon him, does that mean I'm willing to quit complaining and start praising God? Does that mean I'm willing to move beyond letting feelings and my preference make decisions? And human logic make decisions? And place my decision making upon the Word of God? Remember, it's about being a witness. Does that mean I'm willing to forgive and move on and get right? So I can be a witness of God and not hinder the Spirit doing its work in me? Because I'm not surrendered. What does Paul say in Galatians 5, 16? Walk in the Spirit so that you do not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You're either all in for Jesus or you're all in under the control of the devil. And all he wants is the crack in the door because he's got you. He's got you. He, it's not that crack in the door. He gives him a little help bumping it open more. He's got you then. And we don't even realize it. He had Peter by a foothold. He had Peter. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That's why, if you want to be a witness of Christ, you've got to place your dependency upon Him. And you've got to make sure you're right with Jesus. Because without being right with Jesus, I can share the gospel and not be right with Jesus. I can pray and not be right with Jesus. But I don't have the power of God in my life. And if it's not here, it's not going to impact anybody over there. You know, I've said many times, you can't fake the power of God in your life, but you can't hide it either. Amen? Amen. Amen. In closing, I want to say this. We've been talking about prayer. We've been talking about fasting. We've talked about humility and expressing dependency upon Him. We've been talking about being self-disciplined, self-controlled. 
Now you might say, I'm only one person. What can my prayer life do? Me getting right with God, I mean, how much of a difference could that really make in reach, God reaching people in Putney or reaching people in my family or whatever? Well, how many people did God use to go on the cross to die for our sins? One. Amen? Amen. And by the way, on the other side of that coin, how many people does it take to be out of the will of God in the church to keep the church from having revival? Does it take 51% of the church? At least a foothold, like 12%, right? One person. There's power in one. And that's why James says the prayers of a righteous being or a righteous man accomplish as much. I want to encourage you to begin to fast. So this clearly taught through the Word of God, been clearly practiced all throughout church history. To fast about whatever needs and burdens God places upon your heart, about your household, but on top of that, with a sincere heart that's already gotten right with Jesus. Pray, say, God, in this season of First Baptist Putney's life, give us Putney for the glory of God. Give us Putney that we can win people through your power for the, for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? But you know what? For that to happen, for us to take that challenge, to place our dependency upon God to fast, we have to choose to fall in that category, Jeremiah. That we're going to seek Him with all our heart. And we're not going to let things keep us from seeking Him. We're not going to let the Solomon Gore of this world keep us from seeking God with all our heart. Amen?